Oh, gracious Lord, grant us the mercy of clearly seeing the real gospel of Christ. And raise up within us a standard and a loyalty and a commitment and a love and a joy in the gospel that we will never for the remainder of our days turn from it or turn from Christ, we pray. Bless as we think on these things. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5, fifth chapter of Galatians. We thought together last week on verse 1, the freedom that we have in Christ. And it is important that we recognize that our salvation gives us freedom in Christ. Christ, and that any other approach to salvation is to be subject to slavery. However, we'll see in this fifth chapter that freedom doesn't mean doing what you want. It doesn't mean being the God and the controller of your life. It means rather to do what God would have you to do. To be what God would have you to be. What he created you to be in Jesus Christ. We'll walk together through that as we uh, get down later. Verse 13 and following. But we have some marvelous stuff to think about before then. Today I want to talk to you about focus on Christ And I have certainly in mind the Hebrews 12 passage that tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. And I think that is exactly what the Bible is telling us here. It's been a long time since we've been working with Galatians over a year. But I want to remind you, it would be helpful to read chapters 1 through 4 again to refresh your mind regarding How we got to this fifth chapter. Certainly in view of every chapter. Is Paul's deep concern. For these Christians. And I believe they were believers. That they were in danger of going back. Away from Christ. This should be a warning for us today. The church should take this to heart. The devil is trying. And always does try. To remove us from Christ. And we should focus on him. And I believe that's what verses 2 through 6 talks about. Let's follow along as I read it to you. Behold I Paul say to you. That if you receive circumcision. Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I will testify again to every man who receives circumcision. That he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. This is the word of the Lord. May his name be praised. Let's grasp the essence, the presenting problem of what Paul is addressing. Circumcision was a religious ritual That was used as a sign of God's covenant promise embraced by the Jewish people. Interestingly enough, it was actually commanded by God to Israel. 
to keep this ritual or religious rite. And circumcision became, sadly, too important to these people. They came to believe that if they were circumcised, they must be right with God because they were circumcised. And they forgot that circumcision was a symbol of their relationship in covenant with God. These Christian people to whom he writes were primarily Jewish people. And they were having a problem, dare I call it, a temptation. They had come to Christ. They had embraced Christ. They had trusted in Christ. But now as they got to thinking about it, they, they thought, I think we'd like to go back to the Mosaic Law. And add Moses to Jesus. And add circumcision to faith. Wouldn't that be a better Christianity? To have Christ plus Moses. To have faith plus circumcision. And Paul almost, it feels, screams through the text. No, no, a thousand times no. Let me suggest to you that I'm fully aware that probably you don't feel convicted by this statement on circumcision. I hear a collective, hmm. But may I suggest that what the apostle is saying here is much broader than just circumcision. It does involve circumcision. But he is meaning this. If anyone tries to add anything to Jesus, then you're lost. It doesn't matter how much you tell me you love Jesus. If you think Jesus is not enough. If you think the cross is not enough. If you think the shed blood of Christ is not enough. If you think Jesus plus anything else. You are not a Christian. Pastor that's a strong statement. I think I have biblical warrant for making it. In this text. May I make a marginal note? Although it's not specifically said here. I almost sense. As I read these words. About these Jewish believers. Feeling the pressure. To go back. To the law. I almost hear. Families. Talking to them. They live in a Jewish culture. They come from Jewish families. They live in a Jewish society. And everywhere they go, they see Jewishness. And so they have to live with the constant, constant pressure. And some are saying, you're not really Jewish anymore because you say you follow Christ. You and I feel pressure. Conform in this way. Believe this to be true. Go along with the way things are going now. If you're going to be a Christian. There is cultural and societal pressure here. And I feel it. And you feel it. And I want to make a point. The church of Jesus Christ. I, I heard a man say. It on a recording not long ago. And I, I greatly admire him. And I heard him say he felt, and he's an older man now, that the church, the evangelical church of Jesus Christ is in more danger today of losing the gospel than it's ever been in his entire life. So I think this is pertinent to you and to me. Now, let me give you five statements made in the text that addresses why adding anything to Jesus is a bad idea. There are five statements that he makes. First, in verse 5.
I'm sorry, verse 3. Again, I say to you, every man who receives circumcision, that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Paul was saying to them this. If you want to add circumcision, you can't just add circumcision. You've got to add the entirety of the Mosaic law. Verse 4, he adds a second statement. You who are seeking to be justified by the law. These first two statements are very important because they explain what they're trying to do when they're adding anything to Jesus Christ. They are trying to to keep the law as a basis for their righteousness, and two, they're seeking to be justified by that law, that is, to be righteous before God on the basis of what they do in keeping the law. Now, that is very, very important. And here's how we can apply that to our own day. I've met folks who, who believed several things that apply here. First, I've met folks who think God saves but we, he doesn't save all the way. We have to add some of our own. I've actually heard Baptists talk like that on occasion. God does his part. You got to do your part. And those two parts go together to make salvation. What that actually is. And I remember as a child thinking this in church. Because I, I thought I heard someone talk about faith like it's something we generate, something that's ours, and we bring that. So God provides Jesus and the cross, and we provide faith. And I wondered, how then is faith not a good work? If it's something you provide, how is that not a good work? Obviously, the scripture says repeatedly and consistently, we're not saved by works. Ephesians 2 is a good place to look for that. And yet here, if you add anything to Christ of yourself, of your own life, of your own effort, then you are seeking to be justified by what you're adding, being justified before God. And it means you have to become perfect. If you want to be saved by works, you can be saved by works. And perhaps you'd be surprised to hear me say that. But here's, here's the, the fine print. You have to be perfect. Oh, by the way, you're not, so it's already too late. The point is, there is absolutely no way to be saved by works. Sometimes I hear people say it like this. Well, God saves me, thanks be to God, but I have to keep keeping myself saved. I have to keep holding on, and I'm afraid I'm going to let go. And in fact, some would actually interpret that statement in verse 4 about falling from grace as someone letting go. So I bring perseverance. I, I bring endurance. I bring determination. It's up to me to stay saved after God saves me. This text throws that out again. Because it's by grace. It's not by works. It's by grace. It's through Christ. It's not by law. Jesus Christ, God the Father sent Jesus Christ because you couldn't save yourself. That's the whole purpose of his coming. Third statement. If you want to go the legal route, the law route, verse 2, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now just let that set in for just a minute. How many of you would like to go down the road without Jesus Christ? That, that absolutely no aspect of his saving work on the cross is beneficial to you. Do any of you want to go down that road? I don't think so. Nor do I. And yet that's what's going to happen if you add anything to Jesus Christ. Anything. His saving work, his atoning merit is not beneficial to you. Another statement that he makes here in verse 4 is you have been severed from Christ. And the NASB translates that verb very, very well. 
you have been severed. It's like, it's like this great sword has come down and sliced your connection from Jesus Christ. And that to me is a state of being cursed. To be severed from Jesus. Can you think of anything worse to occur in your life than to be separated, severed, thrown out from Christ? In fact, one of the saddest verses has this idea in it in Ephesians 2, 2, 12. And this describes those who are not saved. If you try to present your righteousness, your works, your commitment, your religiosity, even in addition to Christ and the cross, you are thus severed from Christ. And the fifth statement in verse 4 is you have fallen. From grace. This means very simply put. That you cannot be saved by grace. If you're trying to be saved by works. Grace means works are not enough. And by the way. And this should be a point of rejoicing for us. It is all salvation is all by God's grace from beginning to end. I was chosen by his grace before time began. I was brought to repentance of sin by his grace. I was shown the beauty of Christ. I was brought to faith in Christ by grace. I am kept by grace through the power of the Holy Spirit in sanctification. And one day when I die, grace will take me home. It is by the saving, sovereign, all-sufficient grace of Jesus Christ that I'm saved. And at no point in that process, and if you have a question about textually, go to, in your mind, go to Romans 8 and look about verse 28 and following through verse 30. And you'll see this glorious link, this, this chain of all these glorious things that grace provides for you. Again, I repeat these five things. If you try to add to Christ, if you try to add to salvation, you need to understand that you are subject to all the law. You have to be perfect. And you are trying to be justified by the law. Christ is of no benefit to you. You are severed from Christ. And you are fallen from grace. That's the five statements that he gives. About those who try to add anything to Jesus Christ. I think he's made his argument well. Now. Let's do some application and can further consideration. What is being said here in this passage of Scripture? Let me suggest a number of things. Number one, Christ himself is the one and only Savior. And there is no other way to be saved except through Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, you say that a lot. For good reason. For good reason. It seems as though there are those who just can't seem to get that. We think perhaps that there's some benefit of us. And by the way, do you know where this self-righteousness comes out? It's when we think ourselves better than someone else. I see that a lot. Judgmentalism. Hypercriticism is based on a perception of self-righteousness. I want you to know, I, I want you to understand that I deserve hell. I have no basis by which to judge anyone else. The only reason I'm saved, if I'm saved, is Jesus Christ alone. I want you to know I don't care if your mom or dad were great. I'm sure they were. You're raising a great home. That's wonderful. God bless you. And you're obviously in a great church. And you're trying hard. Oh, that's great. But none of that adds one sliver to your righteous standing before God. (laughs) If you're saved, you're saved through Christ alone. Hear the word of God, Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. 
There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. First Timothy 2, 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And in the hour of your death, look to him, not to yourself. Not to your faith. Not to your righteousness. Look to him. And him alone. Number two. For Christ to save the sinner. The sinner must have. Full faith. In Christ's saving work. Without. Putting anything else. Or trusting anything else. In that faith. Now I'm being a bit. Um, unfair. Really with you. When I say full faith. Because there is no other faith than full faith. But I want to make sure that you understand. Faith is not sliced up into pieces. It's not faith in Christ and faith in what I do. It's faith in Christ alone. And whenever you read in the scripture where we are told to believe in him. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That word believe means one who places his or her full faith on Jesus Christ. John 3 says again. He who believes in the son has eternal life. This is believing with all of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to say Christ in his death upon the cross is sufficient to bring me forgiveness of my sins, cleanse me of my sins, to make me righteous before God, to make me justified before God, to make me a child of God, adopt me into the family of God, and save me from myself and his wrath and all of the wretched things in this world. And faith in Christ by God's saving grace is all I need to take me to heaven. That's it. Full faith. Now, be careful. Oh, don't say, we don't have it to do anything. Remember, I warned you earlier that freedom doesn't mean freedom from doing stuff. But it's freedom to do stuff that we'll talk about later in the chapter. But it, it, it puts works in a correct position. We work because we're saved. Not work to be saved. There's a big difference in those two concepts. Third, this passage of scripture along with other passages. Make clear that Christ's saving work on the cross is a finished work. It is a perfect work work and nothing can or should be added to it and Hebrews talks about once for all it uses that phrase quite a bit once for all Jesus died once for all and the, he means by that that his death was absolutely perfect never in your life as a believer should you feel like you are continuing to be saved. You're continuing to be a child of God. Because of anything you do. It is not you holding on. It is him holding on to you. And finally as I've already stated. To be saved in Christ. Means we're saved by God's sovereign grace. From beginning to end. I want you to feel. The power of what he's saying. And I'm going to make two statements. That I think will summarize it. He is saying here. These two things. One. If you're trying to be saved. Through something you do. Then you are lost. Now just get the feeling of that. If you're trying hard. If you're working hard. You're fasting. You're praying. You're, you're trying to read the Bible. You're, you're trying to confess sin. You're just working as hard as you can in order to be saved. I'm here to tell you you're lost. And I'm here to tell you you can't be saved by that. No matter how hard you are. I commend you for your work. But it will never save you. Please come to grips with this. 
And two, if you're depending upon Christ to save you through his saving work in the cross, then you depend on nothing else. That's enough. Do you see freedom in that? Freedom. Now he ends in verses 5 and 6. Which I think verses 5 and 6 are, are tremendous. Because they are, they are given to show the contrast of one who is truly saved and, and knows the gospel. And it also blends well with where he is going to go in the rest of the chapter. Look at verses 5 and 6 again. Here he makes four statements relative to how real saved people who really get the gospel, how we live. We, for we, and by the way, in the sentence structure, the word we, the subject, is in the emphatic position. We, in contrast to they, who are trying to go back to the law. We, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. I need, I need to work through this with you before I'm done. First, he tells us that when you believe on Christ, it is because of the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We are commonly told as Baptists that we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. I had a young lady come to me many years ago now in tears. And she said, the Spirit's not here. Well, I would rather disagree. Anywhere the Holy Spirit preaches the word of God in power through the preaching is certainly there in the service. When people are growing in grace, the Holy Spirit is present. When people come to the repentance of sin, the Holy Spirit is present. The point is, it's through the Holy Spirit, verse 5, that we are brought to faith in Christ. Aren't we glad for that? You can look all through the, uh, the Pauline epistles in the New Testament, and you'll see him returning to this theme over and over and over. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, in that passage where he talks about spiritual gifts, he, he talks about confessing Jesus as Lord through the Spirit. Romans 8, 9, he talks about that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Christ. When you come to Christ, it's because the Spirit brought you to Christ. It's because the Spirit inhabits your heart and your life and has taken up residency in you. Second, we come to Christ by faith, verse 5. Faith is not a work. It is a means by which we embrace the work, the saving work of Jesus Christ. There are wonderful passages throughout the New Testament that affirm this. Yes, James does talk about faith without works is dead. But James is saying works come from those who are indeed saved by faith and not to make them right before God. Third, in verse 5. He, he gives kind of an interesting statement. We believers who are saved through Christ alone are waiting for the hope of righteousness. What was the concern of the Jewish people with the law? They wanted to be righteous. And he says here, we're waiting for the hope of righteousness. Well, someone might rightly ask, does that mean we're not righteous? We're waiting for it, but, but we don't have it yet? No, we are positionally righteous in Jesus Christ. Ephesians talks about that. Romans talks about that. All through the New Testament, we are righteous before God, which means we're justified before God through faith in Christ. Well, why are we waiting in hope for righteousness? Because you're not experiencing righteousness all the way yet. Right? I don't know. Maybe you're perfect. Maybe you're the one that needs to get up here and preach. Because you've got it all worked out. Or are you like me? You're still growing in Christ. Still growing in godliness. Here's the point. We who are saved in Christ. We are waiting 
And we have that hope that one day we will be absolutely righteous in every respect when we are taken to heaven. Isn't that a great vision? And finally, verse 6, this is a powerful statement. And he introduces it. I love what he says. In Christ Jesus, circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. But faith working through love. See, there's your working. Faith working through love. And he's going to scratch what that looks like for the remainder of the chapter after he addresses once again that they need to overcome the hindrances that are facing them in understanding the true gospel. Well, let me say in closing a number of key things that I think we need to think about. The most precious thing, the most precious treasure that we have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please hear me. If you think, oh, we got that, we got that. Preach on something that we already know that. If, if that's how you think, you're in danger of losing the gospel. If you think you don't need to hear the gospel because you already got the gospel. Satan is setting you up to lose the gospel. Because we are always in life. Hear me, brothers and sisters. We're always drifting. We're drifting with a current. And the current is culture. And the current is society. And the current is CNN. And the current is Hollywood. And the current is New York Times. And the current is what you hear in college. It's, you're swimming in a current. And you've got to learn to swim upstream against the current. How do you do that? By rejoicing in the gospel. Studying the gospel. Singing the gospel. We talk about this a lot. When there are times she'll want to pick songs that go with my sermon. And that's hard sometimes. Right? And I've told her, I said, look. When you can't find a song that fits what I'm going to say. Sing songs about the glory of God or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll be right on point. Because that's what it's about. The exaltation of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll be honest with you. I think if the American culture, to whatever degree it was affected by Christianity, it is no longer so. We're living in an in a post-Christian period, I believe, in the early days of anti-Christian culture. There is a new service that I can just hardly look, read because every week they have articles against Christians and often against Southern Baptists. Just wait till after the convention's over next week. They delight in attacking Christians. That's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. We're swimming upstream. To whatever extent tomorrow may be good, it will depend upon us being faithful to the gospel today. And that's true of your life as well. That's why we're here. That's who we are. We're not here to be big. We're here to be faithful. We're here to be real with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think 20 years hence, if you could just leapfrog 20 years, you're going to be stunned to see what's going to happen in churches that claim to be gospel churches. May God help us individually to be faithful and collectively to be faithful to the gospel that rests on Jesus Christ alone. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we need to confess today that we're not as smart as the devil. He is, 
He's crafty. He is deceitful. He takes things that sound good, that sound right, and he twists them and turns them into an instrument of wickedness to attack the truth. Lord, we've got to be smart. We've got to be wise. We've got to stay with the truth of your word. We must be filled with your life. We beseech you, yes, as we sang a moment ago, here we raise our Ebenezer, for by, the, by your grace, by your assistance, hither we've come to this point. But we confess to you that our future faithfulness will be absolutely dependent upon you as well. Please keep us faithful. Give us courage. Give us love. Fill us with faith and hope. And use us for your glory in our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.